Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the May 25th, 2023 special meeting of the St. Mary's County Board of Appeals located in the Commissioners of St. Mary's County meeting room of the Chesapeake Building, 41770 Baldridge Street, Leonardtown, Maryland. I am Chairman Dan Ekniowski, and with four other board members present, we have met our requirements for a quorum and will proceed with this evening's meeting. Residents at home may view the meeting on channel 95 and YouTube. All case documents may be used, viewed on the county's board docs site. Since this meeting is a meeting only, I will not open this meeting for public testimony. The board members that are here present, I'll ask them to introduce themselves on my right. Good evening, Wayne Medinsky. Ronald Payne. And again, Dan Nikniowski. Good evening, Rich Richardson. Good evening, Guy Bradley. And also here is Mr. Steve Scott, the board attorney. And in the absent this evening is Lynn Dallahay with a, uh, a family ma matter. Also in the audience tonight and supporting staff in attendance are John Hauser, the assistant county attorney, Courtney Jenkins, the deputy director of land use and growth management, Amanda Yow, the zoning administrator, Stacy Clements, a planner three with land use and growth management, uh, Andrew Cheney is not here. Um, Jim Gotch, Director of St. Mary's County Department of Public Works. Brandy Glenn, Planner 4 for Land Use and Growth Management. In the v media v room, control room, is Amy Carter, uh, the media producer, and also here is Amber Thompson, the permit manager. Also in the audience tonight are the proponents of the motion to dismiss the lawyers, Stuart A. Cherry. Okay, thank you. And Peter Hershey, thank you. The opponents of the motion to dismiss the lawyers are G. Macy Nelson. And Alex Votaw. Ms. Votaw is not here, oh. I'm just here alone. Okay, thank you. And then there are uh, members of both parties here tonight, and I won't go through them unless the attorneys want to address them. We have only one case on the agenda this evening. Case number one is a motion to dismiss Seven Point Agro Cultivation Center Appeal, ZAAP 18000001405. The applicants have filed a motion to dismiss this appeal alleging that there are no legal grounds upon which to base an appeal. Tonight's hearing concerns only this motion and will consist of summaries of relevant staff reports and legal arguments by the parties council only. There will be no public testimony, as I've said before. Upon the close of arguments by council, the board will then deliberate on the pending motion. As no testimony will be accepted tonight, no oaths will be needed to be administered unless staff has to jump in. The order of presentation will be John Hauser, the assistant county attorney. Uh, he will present the staff report, including timelines of relevant facts. Um, John Hauser and Lugham staff will answer any questions from the board. Counsel for the proponent of the motion to dismiss the facility owner will, be present, will present arguments in favor of the motion and answer any questions from the board. Next would be the counsel for the opponents of the motion to dismiss the citizen appellants. Uh, and they will present arguments against the motion and answer questions from the board. After that, the counsel for the proponent of the motion, the facility owners, excuse me, will be permitted to make a final argument and answer additional questions from the board. The board will request and hear any additional material and information, arguments, and evidence as the board deems necessary. The board will now move to the, then will move to the discussion and decision portion of the meeting. Uh, that is the introduction to what's happening tonight, and I guess now I'll call on John Hauser for his presentation. Good evening, members. Uh, once more for the record, John Hauser, Assistant County Attorney, speaking on behalf of the Department of Land Use to Growth Management this evening. Um, 
as you know, as Chairman just said, it's a bit of an atypical proceeding tonight. Uh, a motion to dismiss has been filed alleging that the Board of Appeals does not have jurisdiction to hear any dispute or issue over the alleged matter. Uh, we see those very rarely here in the Board of Appeals, and I'll acknowledge that up front. Uh, because this is a motions hearing only, we thought that we would present the staff matter a little bit differently than we normally would, since the idea is that this should be decided on undisputed facts and legal arguments only. There's no need for testimony. There's no need for staff to present or be sworn in or for anyone else. And the idea was that I would walk through the staff report, which is a basic summary of actions made, the context of this case, when those decisions were taken, and what it is that uh, we think brings us here tonight, and then offer an explanation to any questions the uh, members of the Board of Appeals have over what exactly is going on to the best of my ability and why Lugum made the determinations it did in this case, whatever those questions might be. So walking through the staff report, uh, 21416 Abel Road is a medical cannabis growing facility. Uh, you will see in some of the matters tonight that it was previously referred to as 21420 Abel Road. In some of the older documents, there was a fairly recent address change. But for the purposes of going forward tonight, the address of the facility itself is 21416. I'll do my best to refer to it by that new address, but I may slip and some of the older materials will refer, refer to it as 21420 Abel Road. There was a it's a 26.38 uh, acre parcel, more or less, fronting Abel Road and Gerard Coase Road in 7th District. Uh, the very first permit application for a medical cannabis growing facility on that site was submitted on July 11, 2018. At the time, there were no separate use categories for medical cannabis cultivation, processing, or dispensaries in the St. Mary's County comprehensive zoning ordinance. Medical cannabis had been legal for a few years at that point, and the code had not been adapted or updated to reflect that. What existing staff did at that time was determine which of the existing uses the proposed use was most substantially similar to. In this case, that was use type five, crop production and horticulture, and they processed the application according to the standards for that use. After the initial submission in July of 2018, the plan went through numerous revisions, updates, amendments by the applicant, and finally on October 27, 2021, Lugum approved a permit site plan under the original permit number of 18-1405. Shortly after that, a group building permit for the medical cannabis quote unquote grow house. And from here on out, I'll refer to this structure as the grow house, was issued on November 18th, 2021. On August 23rd, 2022, the commissioners of St. Mary's County adopted a zoning text amendment adopting new cannabis use types for the comprehensive zoning ordinance. Up until that point, there were no separate use types for cannabis. The building permit was still issued. Construction for the grow house was underway at that point. Uh, St. Mary's County's Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance organize, uh, recognizes both the vested right that a property owner has to carry on a non-conforming use <coughs> if a subsequent revision to the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance should render a previously fully conforming use non-conforming with the new code. St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance also recognizes that non-conforming uses may not be quote unquote expanded or enlarged, except under certain conditions and according to a certain process found in Chapter 52.3 of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. There were no revisions to the building permit that was issued back in November of 21 until, September, until October of 2022. In September, of 2022, Lugum uh, received notice from the St. Mary's County Health Department that an amended septic site plan had been approved by the health department. 
That amended septic site plan allowed the creation of a new septic sand mound system that would serve this grow house. There was about three weeks of back and forth between land use and growth management and, health determined to, and the health department to determine exactly what had been approved and whether that approval was going to stand as it was. When we finally got final confirmation from the health department that that septic plan approval would stand as is without any further need for clarification or revisions, Lugum summarily allowed the applicant to come in and change the septic plan that was depicted on the site plan they have on file at land use and growth management. Lugum's position, what the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance says, is that there are, Lugum does not participate or does not conduct any independent review of septic plans itself. Lugum's quote unquote review, uh, so to speak, consists solely of, in a case like this, where there's a private septic system, of looking for whether or not appropriate approvals have been received from the health department or the Department of the Environment, whichever the applicable organization would be. Uh, once again, we can once Lugum confirmed that, that approval was received, Lugum issued or allowed that amendment to be made to update their site plan accordingly and sent out a notice to adjacent property owners and other members of the public who had been requesting steady updates of any permitting activity that would happen at the facility as Lugum would learn about it or as Lugum would take any sort of notice, acknowledgement, action, or approval with respect to that facility. A letter from Director Hunt was sent out on October 17th stating erroneously that a septic site plan, that a septic permit had been approved by Lugum uh, after much consultation with the Department of the Environment and the Health Department, a correction letter was sent out on December 19th clarifying that what had been done at Lugum was an update of the site plan to, to show a revised septic site plan and that septic permitting was the uh, domain and authority of MDE and it's a designee the health department exclusively and that Lugum does not issue approvals for septic systems itself. An appeal was noted on November 9th. There were simultaneously appeals noted challenging the um, decision through the Maryland Department of the Environment and at the state level. My understanding is that appeal is still ongoing today. We held this appeal in abeyance, the consent of the parties, seeing that if there were a decision that the Maryland Department of the Environment, that they would rescind that site plan approval. Obviously, Lugum's, the updated site plan on file with Lugum would go away as well. Uh, once we received indication that uh, they would not be overturning or issuing any sort of stay or injunction of the septic permit, uh, we decided that it was ripe to bring this appeal forward, which is how we come here today. That was my planned summation, understanding that I think it's very unlikely that was going to answer everyone's question or bring total clarity to the situation. So at this point, I'd ask <coughs> questions that the Board of Appeals might have or what more might be able to said to help clarify the board's understanding of the situation from the department's perspective. Do the board members have any questions? Mr. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm, I'm thinking the, the other party might answer a lot of them in their rebuttal or their case or their presentation. Did the uh, address change affect any of the permits? that have been approved? No, the address change is clerical only. The um, only thing that the address change uh, matters or what relevance it has for tonight is understanding that uh, the address that we find online is not the 21420 Able Road that's referenced all through this. From this, from the time of that address change. Uh, yeah. uh, as an adjacent property owner, I've never received Quiet, quiet please, quiet, please. Just be on the record. 
So an address change was processed to differ to separate the medical cannabis facility that is on the property and a pre-existing single family residence that is on the property as well. The residence going forward bears the address 21420. The cannabis facility bears the address 21416. So clerical only doesn't affect any permits. No, it's no substantive or material effect on uh, permitting that was done, <clears throat> I think, the proceeding tonight. And did I hear you correctly to say that the site went from conforming status to non-conforming status due to rule change or actions, or was it always considered a non-conforming site? So it went from uh, <clears throat> when it became legally non-conforming is when the zoning text amendment was adopted in August of 22 and created new standards for cannabis facilities. This facility would not meet those new standards. That is what renders it legally non-conforming. Prior to that, again, it had been processed under use type five. It met those standards. Use type five was allowed in the Rural Preservation District, the relevant zoning district for this facility. Uh, going forward, cannabis facilities under the zoning text amendment are not allowed in the Rural Preservation District, among most other zoning districts. So is there a grandfather clause, because you mentioned that the county recognizes the fact that it was one time conforming, is there a grandfather clause or a grandfather action that would allow this facility to continue, or is it just simply that the county recognizes, yeah, we gave it to you, you can continue. Which way does that go? So I think probably a that real property scholar or an answer might tell you that we'd be forced to acknowledge the um, vested right and the right for a property to continue in a legally non-conforming use because of constitutional considerations, but it's also codified in the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, both in Chapter 27, which recognizes that Maryland, uh, St. Mary's County recognizes Maryland's common law precedents for vested rights, which say in so many words that a vested right is a constitutional constitutionally protected right to carry on a use that through some subsequent change to the law was rendered non-conforming, again, so long as that use isn't enlarged or expanded illegally. In Chapter 52.3 comes of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance comes language saying that illegally non-conforming use, once it's rendered that by a change to the law, is allowed to continue, but may not expand or be enlarged unless it fits certain criteria that are enumerated in that uh, chapter, or if it's deemed to not be an expansion or enlargement either, under Let, the definition at law. Let's touch on expansion and enlargement. Um, and I know we're gonna get into this later, but I'd like to hear your viewpoint, your view on this solely. Expansion or enlargement, does that relate solely to physical size of building or property? So that, it, that is the bright line that Lugum is trying to draw in this case. Um, answer, of course, as subsequent counsel are going to tell you is that perhaps not necessarily so, and we may have misinterpreted Maryland law when we did that, and there's gonna be a lot of argument and discussion tonight over whether that, but Lugum's position when the zoning text amendment was being drafted and the question was being asked, what does this mean for the existing facility? Our thought was that as long as the existing footprint of that building, of its roughly 52,000 square feet, stays as is, it will be able to continue as a legally non-conforming use and they're allowed to kit out that building as they will. Um, use type zoning, began about in Maryland a hundred years and a week ago on May 14th, 2020, or 1923, when Baltimore adopted our first zoning, our state's first zoning ordinance. The first case that I could find that came up in Maryland's courts that addressed this question of illegal expansion or enlargement of a use and where do you start drawing the line comes in 1939. And since that date, when we looked at it, our opinion was that there's a fairly clear, fairly consistent pattern across all the decades since then and now that when a non-conforming use stays in substantially similar facilities as what it had the moment it became non-conforming, it will be allowed regardless of what is going on inside. So long as the use itself doesn't change or become a new use or 
become something materially different than what it was. So, come on, quiet, quiet, quiet. I'll clear the room if you keep this up. So, enlargement, does that apply to crop yield? Because if they're now increasing or enlarging the crop yield coming out of the building, does that meet the criteria for enlargement? So here's my opinion, the core of it. And I position Lugum take is that it does not. Uh, the reason being is that the quantity of a product coming out, the number of hours a non-conforming use may be open, the number of the frequency at which something is going on, those, as those go up or down, do not change the analysis we think Maryland's courts have found as far as whether or not the legally non-conforming use happens. Um, Maryland's case law is fairly replete with examples of this, of non-conforming junkyards being found that no matter how many, no matter how high we stack the piles of used cars, that in the case of a illegally or legally non-conforming rowboat rental marina in Anne Arundel County, it doesn't matter how many rowboats are on the pier available for rent as that number goes up or down. So long as it's the same use, the quantity, so to speak, does not matter. So if that quantity has side effects, that enlargement of quantity has side effects, either environmental or impact to structure or impact to resources, does that apply in this case at all? under Lugum rules. So, so if you use your rowboat, now you've got more wood debris being produced. You've got more waste being produced. Does that apply under the um, definition of enlargement or is there any other things that would fit along those lines into Lugum's definition? In my estimation of what the balance of Maryland's case law says on the subject, I don't think so. Again, so long as the fundamental characteristics and nature and type of use remain unchanged, the quantity doesn't render something <clears throat> legally non-conforming. All right. Okay. Any other question? I've got one. If now we have decided that it is a, that the, the site has a vested right for the existing building that's under construction that was completed construction on the site. The expansion of the septic system, does that have to go through a non-conforming use process? That's the question tonight. Um, Lugum, when it went through, did not go through the analysis. We did not believe that an expansion of a septic system is a non-conforming use. The reason being that this comprehensive zoning ordinance does not give Lugum any right of review for septic systems. That all we look for in a case like this is a simple check to see whether or not the appropriate approval from Maryland Department of the Environment and the Health Department are there. And once we see it is, there's no exercise of discretion on Lugum. There's no discussion over whether or not we think more might be or should be required. It's the ball game's over as soon as that shows up in a case like this. Because it's not something that would have ever been in Lugum's jurisdiction at all, we did not think it could be the basis for Lugum to determine that this could be an expansion or enlargement of a non-conforming use. In all of those cases that I found that we summarized, um, whenever there was an expansion or enlargement found, I don't think there was an example in that law where it wasn't predicated upon something where the applicant or the property owner had to come into their local zoning authority and ask permission for. And the septic permit does not require that in St. Mary's County. Thank you. That does spark another question in my mind. What about occupancy? <clears throat> Once they uh, expand the intensity or enlarge the intensity, now you're getting into more occupants into the system or building. How is that affected? But how is that addressed in Lugum guidelines? So we don't think it is. Lugum does not, except the only example that comes to mind are home occupation permits, a fairly <coughs> unique and uh, niche area of the comprehensive zoning ordinance. Lugum does not really regulate how many employees you have under the roof. I think the other way to look at it is that the employees number of employees isn't 
what a non-conforming use analysis turns on. It's what is the use that those employees are being put towards. And when all the expanded number of employees can mean is more or less crops under cultivation or under canopy there, mm -hmm. you're not changing the fundamental use at play, was the analysis Lugum did. So number of employees, we have not treat any differently for the purposes of this analysis. Are there any other entities such as fire marshal concerns? Pardon me, gentlemen, I'm sorry. There's um, they, it, some people are having trouble hearing the two of you, so if you don't mind just speaking up a tad, that would be great. You want me to shout again? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so are there any other uh, departmental agencies such as fire department who would need to reweigh in on this issue due to the expansion of either crop yield employees, anything of that, any other environmental agencies that will need to weigh in that may have bearing on Lugum in their decision making? Not that I know of. Um, both when the building permit was issued in 2021 and when the uh, certificate of occupancy was granted this year, uh, Lugum did a thorough look and made sure that every possible outside or external approval that we thought would be required was there in the, fi in the file. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hauser. We will now hear from the council for the proponent. And, wait a second, test me. Uh, <clears throat> so good Mr. evening. Nelson. I'm sorry. You're Mr. Nelson. Yes. Very good. Stuart Cherry, one of the attorneys here for um, the property owner, along with Peter Hershey, who's my co-counsel. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good evening. Um, as I said, my name is Stuart Cherry. I'm a partner at Rifkin Wiener Livingston, a law firm in Baltimore, Annapolis, and I represent Blue Grizz, the landowner. Mm -hmm. um, also with me is my co-counsel, Mr. Peter Hershey, who's an environmental land use and zoning attorney with Rich Henderson in Annapolis. Now, members of the board, you will hear from me about a number of topics, but one thing I wanna say early is that there is a case directly on point from the Maryland Appellate Court called Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf says, and I believe Mr. Hauser acknowledged as such, um, that a county board of appeals does not, well, I'm gonna rephrase, he, he acknowledged that um, septic is not within the jurisdiction of Lugum. Sugarloaf says that a county board of appeals does not have jurisdiction to consider any matter related to septic systems. Now, before I get into the specifics of this appeal, I just wanna speak about some general global issues. Um, this is a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction related to a cannabis facility's grow house septic system. More specifically, this appeal concerns an October 11, 2022 notation by Lugum adding the words new septic in all capital letters um, to the grow house's building permit, which appears in the comments section. That was the only action that Lugum took on October 11. There was not, a, not that's been presented some formal amendment to the site plan so much as that um, building permit has been treated as a site plan amendment by Lugum. Um, Members of the board, if the motion to dismiss is denied, a merits hearing is scheduled to begin in about two weeks. Um, just my client's portion of that case will require multiple nights of hearings. In addition, on May 10, 2023, just a couple of weeks ago, the same protestants who filed this appeal filed two additional appeals to be heard by this body on other issues unrelated. Now, it is clear that the protestants are not filing all of these appeals because they're concerned, for example, with the quality of the septic system. These appeals reflect a preference by protestants that a cannabis growth facility not be in their backyard. They have filed three additional appeals or three additional matters related to just the septic with the health department slash the Maryland Department of Environment. Two matters um, that would proceed in front of the Office of Administrative Hearings, um, and another that would proceed in the St. Mary's County Circuit Court. All three matters are for the same septic system um, for, which, for which the state is the proper adverse party in those appeals, because it's the state that approved a septic permit through the Health Department and through MDE. Thus, in total, there are currently pending six different actions related to the closing stages of this project so far followed by the protestants. Presumably, protestants will keep filing appeal after appeal as different matters come up. 
Now, this is not how the process is supposed to work. It is unfair to my clients, it's unfair to Lugum, and to you as the Board of Appeals. You have other business to attend to besides this one matter, but the protestants are intent to litigating anything and everything, whether they have a basis to do so or not. The protestants will get a chance to argue the merits of the septic matter in the state proceeding in, the, um, in front of the Office of Administrative Hearings through a contested case proceeding in one of the other pending matters. So as I will discuss, the septic challenge before the board should be dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. And that's true for two reasons, members. First, Lugum has no authority over septic approvals, which Mr. Hauser just acknowledged. The notice of appeal specifically claims to appeal a septic permit. There was some confusion, as Mr. Hauser suggested and commented on, based on some paperwork from Lugum that made reference as such. But it eventually clarified, Lugum did, that it does not have jurisdiction over septics. This is because under the Sugarloaf case, which I referenced earlier, the state has exclusive jurisdiction over septic permits, in addition to matters such as piping, apparatus, and the sand mount. Now, there's been some suggestion that the septic approval was appealable to the board because it came potentially in the context of a site plan. Now, that question is a little hard to say if that's exactly accurate because, like I said, what I've seen is a building permit rather than a site plan that had a change on October 11th. But even if that was true, Sugarloaf remains directly on point as we will get to because Sugarloaf concerned a site plan amendment. Sugarloaf concerned a dispute about capacity for, for a septic system that was noted in a site plan. So it does not matter if the septic challenge is dressed up as a site plan amendment or if it's dressed up as a challenge to a septic permit, the state will have exclusive jurisdiction over septics. The second reason why the board has no jurisdiction is that there's no expansion or enlargement of a non-conforming use as a matter of law. Any effort to get around the state's exclusive jurisdiction by claiming that it is about capacity is still a septic appeal. It is still governed by Sugarloaf. It is still another way of saying there should not be a septic of this size, which is all what Sugarloaf says is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the state. Now, under a well-accepted law, increasing the number of people in a building at most is called an intensification. It's a term of art in law, which is not governed by Lugum and which is not prohibited or regulated by the CZO. So again, no jurisdiction. Now I'm gonna also discuss at the end of my presentation some changes to Maryland law that were effective on May 3rd, 2023 um, during the pendency of this appeal as part of the legalization of recreational cannabis. That legislation explicitly limits the rights of counties to impose zoning and other restrictions on cannabis companies. Now this issue can be avoided. The board doesn't have to reach whether or not its cannabis um, zoning ordinance provision, which Mr. Hauser referenced, is preempted by state law if dismissal is granted on the grounds that I'll discuss and that I've referenced. Now, as you all know, this matter relates to a cannabis farm in Abel, Maryland. Blue Grizz is the property owner. Another related entity named Seven Points Agro Therapeutics is the operator. Seven Points was granted a stage one pre-approval for a grower license from the Maryland Cannabis Commission on May 24, 2018. A June 18, 2018 letter from the commission advising the approval is among the materials that you have. Since 2018, the landowner has been working with Lugum for various approvals necessary for this project. The current project, or the current part of the project, is a 52,000 square foot in, indoor, what we call the grow house. Now, before completion of the grow house, Blue Grizz constructed a smaller indoor growth facility. That smaller facility has been operational since November 2021. It has a capacity to grow approximately 1,500 plants. As part of the approval of the smaller facility, a septic tank with a 25 person capacity was approved and installed without any appeals. On November 18, 2021, Lugum issued building a building permit authorizing the construction of the grow house, which was exhibit A to the motion. You, um, you'll note if you look at exhibit A that this is for an over 52,000 square foot building. 
While the existing smaller indoor grow facility can grow 1,500 plants, the maximum capacity of the grow house is approximately 46,000 plants, so it's 30 times bigger. Not bigger, 30, 30 times more capacity to grow plants, if I'm being more accurate. Now, in December 2021, um, an amended building permit authorizing construction of the entire grow house was issued by Lugham, and that's Exhibit B to the motion. On April 13th, 2022, there was a revision to the building permit to correct a typographical error and clarify that the entire building had been permitted for construction in the December 2021 decision, which was Exhibit C. None of these were appealed. And so the grow house was built and completed as approved well before these proceedings. A revised septic proposal was submitted um, to the health department on, a, on April 6, 2022. This was submitted to the health department as an agent for the Maryland Department of Environment to review septic proposals. Despite its name, the county health department is a state and not a county agency. The new septic um, proposal was for a capacity of 76 people, which is combined between the new grow house and the original smaller facility. And this is the natural evolution for the project. This was for a 52,000 square foot building um, with 30 times the growth capacity as the smaller indoor facility. No one would have expected a facility of such size, which was approved without appeal, to be limited to the same 25 people that were already within the capacity of the septic at the existing facility. Instead, the septic was merely installed in phases, or rather was applied for in stages. Now, the October 11, 22 decision from which the appeal is noted, which is again Exhibit E, there's only one change in that building permit, which is that the words new septic are added. This is a line in the comments to the building permit, nothing else has changed. So who approves the septic? This is the exclusive jurisdiction, as I've said, of the county health department, which is a state agency. Yet the protestants clearly have appealed the issuance of what they've called a Lugum septic permit. And there's no such thing. The notice of appeal, and I'm quoting from the notice of appeal, says, quote, the um, appeal of the decision of the St. Mary's County Department of Land Use and Growth Management to issue a permit for a revised Mount septic system. And then later it says, quote, to, um, the, that it is appealing, quote, to approve a permit for a reconfigured Mount septic system. Now, protestants' arguments at their core are an attempt to challenge the capacity of the grow house's septic. Typically, one, if one is not contesting the quality of a septic, if one's not contesting the technical aspect of a septic, you're fighting about capacity. That's what any appeal of a septic system is generally going to be about. And I'm gonna get now more specifically into the case directly on point, Sugarloaf Citizens Association versus the Frederick Board of Appeals from 2016. It's the exact same posture, members of the board. There, there were protestants, just as there are here, and they did not agree with the capacity of a septic tank for a construction pro project related to a very large church being built in Frederick County. The septic issue came up in the context of a site plan approval process. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Frederick County zoning regulations read just like St. Mary's County regs read. As the court in Sugarloaf said, quote, where a site plan includes service by a non-publicly owned community water and sewer utilities. Approval of the plan is conditioned on whether, quote, the facilities meet the requirements of and receive approval from the Maryland Department of the Environment slash the Frederick County Health Department. Per our motion, this is exactly how the St. Mary's County Zoning Ordinance reads. So the fact that it was a site plan in Sugarloaf was irrelevant. Now, when it was approved, the protestants appealed the approval to the Frederick County Board of, Appears, Board of Appeals, the cousin body to this board. The Board of Appeals denied the appeal on jurisdictional ground, just as we have moved to dismiss based on lack of jurisdiction, because septic approvals are state issued. Then the board denied a motion to reconsider. Then on judicial review, the circuit court and the appellate court all affirmed the decision by the Frederick Board of Appeals that it lacked jurisdiction because it was a septic. And in that opinion, it might even be the first sentence, but it's at the very beginning of that opinion, the court says, quote, 
Appellants essentially seek to have this court order the board to review a decision of the health department regarding the property owner's proposed septic system. We shall not do so because the Maryland Code, Code of Maryland regulations, and the Frederick County regulations set up a regulatory scheme that places matters related to septic systems within the sole purview of the health department, a state agency. By granting the motion here on jurisdictional grounds, the board will be acting correctly and as conservatively as it can. It will be acting exactly as the Frederick County Board of Appeals did in Sugarloaf, and that decision based on Sugarloaf would be affirmed if there were any judicial review. If this case is not dismissed, it will be akin to creating concurrent jurisdiction between this body and the Maryland Office of Administrative Hearings, which oversees appeals of actions by state agencies over septic matters. The protestants here are seeking to get multiple bites at this issue. They want to try to get the Board of Appeals to block the use of the septic. If that does not work, they will then seek to get the same result through the state appeal process at the Office of Administrative Hearings, which is why here today um, are the Maryland Department of Environment Division Chief over septic matters, Ms. Naomi Howe, and her lawyer, the lead Assistant Attorney General for Septic Litigation, Lynn Angotti. They are interested enough to be here in person and see the hearing in person due to the state interests at stake. They are here to monitor, monitor what is happening at the Board of Appeals. Now, members of the board, I'm gonna speak about the site plan approval aspect here. The fact that Lugum does not issue septic permits is a fact that has created some confusion and I'm by no means am I being critical of the county. Mr. Hauser was kind enough to acknowledge that there were some er erroneous documents here. Um, and the county staff and, and, Mr., and Mr., um, <clears throat> Mr. Hauser have all worked very hard on this and we appreciate their work. They're good public servants. But the county has no role in septics whatsoever. No discretion was exercised, as Mr. Hauser acknowledged, in septics here on October 11th when the words new septic were added to the building permit. But the reference to, new sept to a new septic has created confusion. Now, attached to the motion as Exhibit F was the October 17 letter that Mr. Hauser referenced from um, the former director Hunt, saying that the county had issued a permit for a sand mound septic system. Um, on October 19, 2022, ironically in, October, in Exhibit F to the opposition followed by the other side, um, Mr. Hauser explained in his letter that Lugum has no requirements other than state approval, which he repeated here today at the meeting. This is exactly like Sugarloaf. There, the county had no requirements for, for approval other than acknowledging whether or not the state had approved or not approved. That is exactly how the St. Mary's County Code reads, or rather how the St. Mary's County Zoning Ordinance, the CZO, reads. Now, Mr. Hauser also referenced um, the amendment to the site plan, um, and as, as we said, we understand that to be the reference in the building permit to there being a new septic. Um, that is not a separately appealable event. Mr. Hauser also said in his October 19th letter that, well, as part of the site plan, we wanted to make sure no new buildings were being added. That observation is not appealable, and no new buildings were added. On December 19th, Lugum issued a new letter in place of, and that's the words of Lugum in the letter, in place of the October 17 letter, correcting and retracting it, noting that Lugum does not issue septic permits. And that was in its own words to correct misstatements. Now, the alleged site plan change is how protestants are trying to challenge the septic in a novel way. They say the new septic took capacity um, of the 52,000 square foot grow house from 25 to 76 people, and then they can appeal it through the site plan. But that is just another repackaged way to challenge the septic and is exactly what happened in Sugarloaf. However, even if we look at the issue of the increase of the number of people as a zoning issue at face value, um, it still fails and, it's, and the appeal still must be dismissed because Logan and the board have no Jurisdiction, they simply don't govern intensity as opposed to expansion or enlargement, which is a subject that Mr. Hauser also addressed. Protest protestants want to take this issue and treat it as a non conforming use analysis. They're trying to treat the new septics as an enlargement or an expansion. Now, arguably, under the ordinance passed by the county commissioners effective in September, the grow house and the research facility are grandfathered non-conforming uses. And because it's grandfathered, <clears throat> the grow house can be finalized without treating it as non-conforming, but 
if Blue Grizz, the property owner, applied for a new growth facility at the building, at the property, for a third building. That, if you were to apply non-conforming use analysis, would be an expansion or enlargement of a non-conforming use, and that would be different than what we have here. The new septic just isn't the same thing. All it does is service the approved grow house that was already issued in an approval by Lugum for 52,000 square feet to allow there to be up to 76 people on the site, including the grow house and the smaller growth um, building. Now, there is no change in the um, additional square footage of the building. The zoning law does not regulate intensification. It is simply not an issue governed by Lugum or this board, so there's no jurisdiction. And in our motion to um, dismiss, we cite Tripp Associates versus Mayor and City Council of Baltimore from the State Supreme Court, formerly the Court of Appeals in 2006, which held that increasing the frequency of non-conforming use is not an expansion. Rather, it is just an intensification. So long as the nature and character of the building are the same, it is allowed without further regulation. Now some examples from some other cases that we cited, and Mr. Hauser referenced some of the same cases. Increasing the number of rowboats at an approved marina. Increasing the quantity and height of scrap metal in an approved scrap metal yard. Increasing the number of delivery trucks that come in and out of a building. Again, intensification, not expansion or enlargement. It is even okay if a facility is approved, and these are other examples of cases that we cited in our motion. If a facility is approved for raising cows and then later allows horse riding, the courts have said that is in the nature of the same use. Another example from the motion is if a facility was approved to play professional baseball and then they decided to also play professional football, that is still in the nature of the same use. Here the grow house is the same size as it was already approved and has been built um, and as it was when the zoning ordinance passed. Now, um, members of the board, I want to address some other issues that were brought up in our papers. One is that there's not a timely appeal. The protestants admit that the decision that they appeal from is the October 11th new septic. In the December 19 letter um, from Mr. Hunt, Lugum confirmed that no final decision on the, sept on the septic was even made on October 11th. So there's no decision to appeal from. The appeal was made on November 9th, between October 11th and December 19th. So there's simply nothing to appeal. Now, in addition, so there was no decision that was appealed, even if you ignored all the other arguments. Because Lugum exercised no discretion 30 days before the appeal, there's no jurisdiction. In Lugum's December 19th letter, it clarified that Lugum's approval of site plans does not authorize, i.e. does not permit, the construction or modification of a septic system. Earlier, does not permit, like issuing permits. Earlier, um, in Mr. Hauser's um, October 19th letter, he said that Lugum exercises no discretion over septics, which is true. We also addressed another issue in our papers, members of the board, the lack of specificity of the notice of appeal. As I said, the only issue that could potentially be appealed, and we've said it can't be appealed, is the use of the words new septic. But the form that you need to fill out to submit a notice of appeal specifically requires, quote, an application for appeal shall identify with specificity all grounds for the appeal. It's in the regulations too. You don't get to file a new or amended notice of appeal. You need to plead it with specificity when you appeal. Here, there are other statements in the notice of appeal that have nothing to do with the septic. Um, that just reference provisions of the code without any statements of fact, without any statements whether or not those provisions apply here, whether or not anything happened to cause a violation. They reference 60.6, .6, which deals with setbacks, buffers, screening, fences, landscaping, walls, curbs, and gutters. Well, which is it? You know, we have a right to know. 60.810, they reference adequate drainage, stormwater, water supply, fire protection, sewage facilities, and other public facilities as provided in accordance with another section, section 7. And all these things reference state regulations as well. Well, where to begin? Um, 60.811, adequate temporary and permanent erosion and sediment control measures according to the requirements of the ordinance. It doesn't say anything about how any of that was violated. So that's just a trial by ambush, respectfully, members of the board. Um, it goes on, more provisions, 70.8, sewage, 70.9, water, without ever saying what exactly it is that they're claiming is a violation 
um, of any of those provisions. Now, specificity, according to case law, requires some assertion of fact to show what is being alleged. For example, in a negligence case, if you were talking about a lawsuit, you must allege facts showing a duty owed and that it was violated. A conclusory statement is not good enough, and the requirements for that um, example are less onerous than here, where the code uses the word with specificity and so does the form. Um, it's a due process <laughs> issue. We have a right to know what it is that we're being accused of. Now, having said all that, I wanna just reference one more issue, which is not here today, but could be here later if the motion is denied. And I referenced earlier, which is the cannabis reform legislation and the possible preemption caused by that event. Now, Protestants assume that they can proceed here because of alleged non-conforming use restrictions on Blue Grizz because of zoning restrictions that the St. Mary's County Commissioners enacted in September. But during the pendency of the appeal, Governor Moore signed legislation on May 3rd, immediately effective, um, reforming state cannabis law to allow for recreational marijuana, not just medical marijuana. Under the new law, the state has taken a more active role in zoning and has explicitly limited the power of counties to enact zoning legislation. This is because one of the purposes of the bill, which established recreational cannabis after a constitutional amendment, no less, um, is to eliminate the illicit or illegal market for cannabis so that consumers are only buying approved product from approved dispensaries. This means the counties cannot take certain steps that would harm the market for cannabis or interfere with cannabis operations. So part of the materials that you've received today um, includes section 36-405 of the new bill. The bill has several relevant parts and I'm actually gonna go in reverse order and start with 36-405C. This says that the use of a facility <coughs> by a cannabis licensee, such as my client, is not required to be submitted to or approved by a county or municipal board, authority, or unit if the facility, one, was properly zoned and operating on or before January 1, 2023. Now, the existing smaller building on the property um, was zoned, constructed, and operating before January 1, 2023. And then it says, two, if the property is used by a grower, that one, held a stage one pre-approval, which is a term of art related to cannabis licenses, um, for a license before October 1, 2022, and two, was not operational before October 1, 2022. Well, that describes the, bro the grow house, which is the subject of this appeal, because it held a stage one pre-approval before that date and only became operational this year. What this means is that the county cannot, under the guise of zoning authority, restrict Blue Grizz's ability to operate. But we do not even have to apply, to, according to that, we don't even have to apply to the zoning board for approval because it's preempted or exempted under the new state law. But then there are other provisions that may be applicable. For example, 36-405B says a political subdivision may not, one, establish zoning or other requirements that unduly burden a cannabis licensee, or two, impose licensing, operating, or other fees or requirements on a cannabis licensee that are disproportionately greater or more burdensome than those imposed on other businesses with a similar impact on the area where the cannabis license is located. And on its face, um, this is a right to farm county, and typically farming is not re um, regarded with any of the restrictions that are imposed on Blue Grizz here. Um, nor are similar restrictions imposed on other potentially unpopular products such as tobacco. Now, 36-405A says that a political subdivision may establish reasonable zoning requirements for cannabis. Now, why, why am I mentioning all this? If the motion is denied, then much of the merits of the hearing will now be about whether the county cannabis ordinance is preempted or no longer enforceable. But if the motion is granted based on the clear law from, from Sugarloaf, and other arguments presented here, then the Board of Appeals does not have to address that at all. Maybe before that issue ever comes up before this board, a similar ordinance in another county will be litigated to the state Supreme Court and answer the question of how provisions like this should be read so that this board never has to deal with it. Now, I, I have no other points to make at this time except to ask that the board please grant the motion to dismiss um, consistent with its jurisdiction. And of course, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them um, and or perhaps to ask my co-counsel to also answer the questions. You have any questions? Okay. 
question? Just, just from my own knowledge, this is really not, has not any bearing on this, but um, the 46,000 plants, what is that, a year or? That's just the capacity of the building, as I understand it. What exactly that means, whether it's 46,000 at once, whether it's a year, I, I don't know. I just know that it's 30 times more than the other grow house or the other building that's on the site. I wish I knew. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. But, but uh, you know, I, I just want to say one more thing, which is, you know, you hear that number and it sounds like a lot, but think about the fact that one of the purposes of the recreational marijuana law is to get rid of illegal sale of that product. And so you have to have a lot of supply. And so that's why the state has taken an interest in making sure that facilities like these are able to operate um, and in our, in our position without having to deal with some of the regulations that we might have to challenge later if they aren't handled somewhere else at another time. But our position is that we don't have to go there right now because we have the comfort of a decision from a Maryland appellate court that on its face deals with this issue. But if we meet again, you'll know the answer to that. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other questions from the board members? Um, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, as you go through the state approval process for to hear have hearings on the uh, appeals there, are there, are the public allowed in those meetings? Yes. Okay. Um, the regulations, the new regulations for cannabis for recreational cannabis, do they replace? the medical cannabis regulations, or are they in addition to? So it's a very good question, and it's very interesting. Um, the way I read the law is that they are supplanting, they are getting rid of um, the previous law on medical, but a lot of the provisions remain the same. But what's really happening is that medical licensees are required to then convert if they want to stay in the market. And so if you have a medical license, you can't, after July 1st, um, just be a medical cannabis licensee. You have to pay a fee and convert to a dual license. And so the new statutes, which they haven't enacted regulations for so far as I know, they're working on emergency ones is my understanding. The new statutes might have some similar language, but it's different, right? Because medical and recreational are just different markets. The original site plan approval for the project was made, help me here, October 21? I think that's right. For the, for the grow house. I mean, there's been approvals related to older buildings, the older building on the property. But for the grow house, in um, October, I think there was an, an approval that was for the foundation. And then in December of 21, it was for the entire building. And then in April of 22, there was a clarification that the December approval was for the entire building because the language, at least some people thought, might not have been clear, so they clarified that. Has there been any substantial change in the site plan over all of those changes? No. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. So we'll stand a little. Hold on, Chairman. I'm sorry. <clears throat> So when was the grow house deemed non-conforming? Was it before? Is that a question for me, That's sir? That's a question for you. When was the grow house deemed, or counselor, uh, deemed non-conforming? Was it after construction was complete, or was it before construction was complete? So in September, the county commissioners enacted the, um, the ordinance or the amendment to the zoning ordinance related to cannabis. Um, and then what applied was the law that Mr. Hauser described, both constitutional and within the zoning ordinance that deals with grandfathering. And so um, approving, continuing to go through the process then for the, um, for the grow house, which was already in site plans and was already referenced in documents, um, is different than say if for example, and if you forget about the governor signing new law that we've described about our recreational, if you forget that, and you just say that tomorrow my client applied for another building, well then that would definitely, um, you know, subject to grandfathering, be an example of the kind of thing that gets discussed under the rubric of um, enlargement or expansion. As opposed to something like the septic, which again is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the state, 
and um, deals with potentially, if you were gonna look at it from a zoning perspective, intensification, which the state Supreme Court has clarified is different than expansion or enlargement. But you also referenced some of the things that the um, protestants brought up about that do fall under Lugum, and that was some of the erosion concerns, the um, runoff, the other things that go around installing that new septic system do fall under Lugum. Well, to, well, I don't know that they do or they don't. Um, I think that to the extent that what we're talking about here is just whether or not a septic will be approved. That is all that's been appealed. That's the only arguable exercise of discretion, although Mr. Hauser has said, and we agree, that wasn't even an exercise of discretion because the only um, approval that's required is that of the state, which is the subject of a different proceeding in front of the Office of Administrative Hearings. And there's not a process then for the county to get involved in septics. And if the um, protestants had wished to allege some other issue, they needed to state what the facts were. They can't just reference code provisions and say, this was violated, this was violated, this was violated. As a matter of constitutional law, my client is entitled to know how that potential um, violation um, occurred. And Mr. Bradley, um, what, what you've articulated is something they could have said in their notice of appeal, but they didn't. In other words, they didn't say there is erosion that's being caused by the septic. They make no statements like that. They just list a number of matters and say, we're aggrieved and there's violations of these provisions. They don't say, here's a fact. You know, if there was a fact, then I might still be here, but I'd be saying something different. What I'd be saying was that Lugum didn't issue any decisions related to that fact. There's nothing to appeal from. And so whatever remedy they may have doesn't include an appeal of, um, to this board. Let me ask a question to council. So referencing a Comar regulation, does that fit the requirements for specificity? So if I go in and reference a Comar saying, hey, this applies, this applies, this applies, do I need to go down to the very specific part of that or can I reference a broad Comar where it may fit? I think um, generally you want to see a reference to a Comar regulation, a law, ordinance, whatever it is, and you want to see the application or the allegation of fact or circumstances within the case and within the, uh, the matter that is applied to that Comar regulation or law or ordinance. So I, I tend to think that you need both. You know, I, if I might address that as well, you know, that's really a fact-specific situation. You have to look at the exact pleading at issue. And here, when there are references to those provisions, all that they say is that appellants assert that the planning director erred when it approved the site plan because the site plan does not satisfy the applicable standards under CZO section 60.8, including but not limited to 60.8, 6, 10, and 11. So let's just take that one sentence because the other sentences are pretty much the same. If this were, and I'm, I apologize that this is the example I'm giving, but it's the best example I can come up with. If this were a circuit court proceeding, because there are specificity requirements in a lawsuit as well, you would have to say um, what exactly the violation of that provision was in order to proceed. And otherwise, the defendant could file a motion to dis dismiss and they would, su they would succeed. Now, there's one big difference between a circuit court proceeding and this proceeding, which is that you have to be even more specific here. Why? Because the form and the regulation in CZO that regulate this have the word specificity in them. And the funny thing about cases that get into specificity is they all say there's no requirement for specificity in a lawsuit. And then they explain what the um, notice requirements are constitutionally that are required by the rules. And what those notice requirements provide is that you have to at least state some basis to assert that, for example, in a negligence case, that the defendant owed a duty to the plaintiff. So why does that person owe a duty? Were they another motorist on the road? Okay, check that box. But if they just say that A hit B um, negligently, 
They haven't established a duty to not be negligent. So that's an example. And then um, they also have to say that what exactly they did, not just the fact that a duty existed, but what exactly they did that was wrong. Um, and there, there's no specificity requirement and complaints get dismissed on this ground. But here, there's actually a requirement for specificity. And so we are entitled, not only constitutionally as a matter of due process, but because of the language of the CZO to some specificity, and we've been given none with that sentence, for example. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure. Were there any other questions? Any other questions, board members? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, members of the board. Now we will hear from the opponent's uh, lawyer, Mr. Macy Nelson. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Macy evening. Nelson, on behalf of the uh, citizen appellants in this case, um, this is a land use case a zoning case. This is not a septic case. This is a land use case, a zoning case. My clients appealed Luggum's approval of an amended site plan, which Mr. Hauser in his staff report confirmed was uh, that Luggum approved an amendment to the site plan on October 11, 2022. He said so in his staff report. October 11, 2022. My adversary says my appeal was late. Incorrect. Section uh, 60.93 says my clients could appeal the approval of a site plan to this body, which we did. We're required to do so within 30 days. We did so in less than 30 days. So my clients appealed the October 11 approval of the amended site plan. The core argument in this case, in the appeal, was that the approval by Luggum of the amended site plan approved the illegal expansion of a non-conforming use. So let me back up. Mr. Bradley, I think you were asked the question about the non-conforming use. Basically, here's, my, here's the way I describe a non-conforming use to my lay clients. Think of a time when a use is permitted and the, 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 the county body, whether it be commissioners or the council, change the zoning rules so as to make that use not a permitted use. But it was in existence before that law was changed. So as of the, as of the moment the law was changed, the previously permitted use is allowed to continue as a quote, non-conforming use under certain circumstances. And, 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 and the, the, the ordinances are designed across the state to sort of gently weed out these non-conforming uses, and they do that in several ways. First, they say, for example, if you shut, not applicable here, but it's just background, if it goes down for a period of time, depending on the jurisdiction, it might be 12 months, 24 months. If you, if you close down for 12 or 18 months, whatever the rule is, you lose it. And then it talks about, well, can you expand it? And every county has a different rule about non-conforming use. Every county has a zoning ordinance. And one, one of the, the good things about my practice is I'm practicing all over the state. One of the bad things about my practice is I practice all over the state. So I'm called upon to look at the language in each county's ordinance. So here in our county, your county, St. Mary's County, we have very precise rules about how you can change a non-conforming use. But so let me just go back to the appeal we drafted, I drafted. May I just read one sentence to you? I listened to this argument for 45 minutes. Nelson didn't do this. Nelson didn't do that, but he did this. And I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, read the next sentence to this body. He didn't, so I'm gonna read it to you. This is my appeal letter dated November 9, 2022. This is the core of this appeal. Further, appellants, those are my clients, assert that the Department of Land Use and Growth Management erred when it determined that the modifications to the uh, septic system did not constitute enlargement or expansion of a non-conforming use. So we're saying that this amended site plan 
generates the question <coughs> of whether this is an illegal expansion of a non-conforming use. So let's go to the ordinance. 52.3, and keep in mind, uh, my adversary was talking about the case in Baltimore, the trip case, where they increased the number of uh, nights that they operated this strip club. And he said the law in Maryland is an increase in intensity, it does not constitute uh, an expansion of a non-conforming use. You gotta look at the footprint of the building, he said. He said, if, I, if my client came in here and said, we want a new building, that might be a non, an expansion of a non-conforming use. And I'm saying, wrong. Let's look at the words in this county's ordinance, 52.3. It's talking about uh, non-conforming uses. Expansion or enlargement of an existing use or structure, this, this, county's juris, this county's ordinance says, talks about the expansion of an existing use or structure. So my adversary is focusing on the word structure when he says to this body, you, you're only, there's only expansion of a non-conforming use if you're increasing the footprint of the structure. I say, with all due respect to him, he's wrong. The words in your ordinance say, refer to an enlargement, expansion, or enlargement of an existing use or structure. So, to me, this is a zoning case that we're gonna talk about on June 8th, whether, whether th this application, this site plan conforms with that, that requirement or not. We say it doesn't. They say it does, but that's what we're gonna litigate on June 8th. This case is not about whether or not the, when I say this case, the case before this body, is not about whether the septic itself system satisfies the requirements of Maryland's law, because that is within the jurisdiction of MDE. We know that, we appeal the septic approval to uh, uh, the Office of Administrative Hearing. Ms. Angotti's here. She's a lawyer for MDE, her client's here. That's, that's, that's where we're gonna address the, the technical issues regarding the septic. Here, the question is whether uh, this amended site plan constitutes an illegal expansion of a non-conforming use. And let me just give you some of the, the reasons why we think uh, this body in, on, in June, when we deliberate on, uh, argue it, should find this an expansion. Let me just tell you some of the changes that this plan facilitates. The original, uh, the original site plan had a septic system with 400 gallons per day. The amended plan has one with 750 gallons per day. The original plan, uh, 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 the original site plan uh, had 25 employees. The amended site plan had 76 employees. Then if you look at the original plan approved by Lugum and compare it to the amended plan approved by Lugum, what do you see? You can see on the plan itself, these are Lugum's notes. They say there's a sewage reserve area of 10,000 square feet on the, old, on the original plan. The new plan, uh, which we appeal, my clients appeal, is 17,700. And under the original plan, they could handle 800 plants. And in the words of my adversary, the new plan, I think you said 30 times greater than that. When we argue whether there's an illegal expansion of the non-conforming use, we're gonna be pointing uh, uh, to that uh, evidence because this is what the, uh, the ordinance says about that. The planning director can authorize the expansion or enlargement constituting 25% or less of the existing use or structure, utilize the standards for conditional use approval. So the planning director can do that administratively up to 25%. 
but if the applicant wishes to increase by more, between 25 and 50 percent, it has to go to a hearing before this body, the Board of Appeals, and you can't get an increase over 50 percent no matter what. So those are the, we argue these, these changes, look at the number of employees, for example, these changes constitute an illegal expansion of the uh, uh, non-conforming uh, use. Let me just summarize the essence of our case. This is a zoning case where my clients, by the ordinance, had the right to challenge to this body, appeal to this body, the amended site plan, which we did. We raised specifically the allegation that this amended site plan approved illegal, an illegal uh, expansion of a non-conforming use, uh, use. We raised it that we're not challenging in this case the technical merits of the septic system. My adversary speaks about the sugar loaf case over and over and over. I urge everybody in this room to read the case and look for the words. Does the word non-conforming use appear in that case? I urge you to do that and pose that question. It doesn't, right? We're arguing illegal non-conforming use. In the, Fred, in, the, in, in the Sugarloaf case in Frederick County, they were saying they wanted the board to look at the technical merits of the septic system. We're not doing that here. We're gonna do that in the OAH case next summer. So I urge you to read that case and, and, and urge you, I think when you do that, if you're arrested, you're gonna reject the characterization of that case by uh, my adversary. You know, I start from the premise that how did we get into this position? How did my clients, and on behalf of one of my clients, I apologize for him speaking out of turn. He did that because <laughs> he's upset, right? And the reason my clients are upset is they're living in their community and, and without, without any notice to them, without any notice to them, before they knew it, the county had approved, we say incorrectly, an industrial warehouse right in close proximity to their homes on rural preservation land in the critical zone. They're upset, they're really upset. How in the world did this county do that? And the commissioners knew, knew it was a mistake, <clears throat> and that's why they enacted the zoning text amendment to make clear that this sh should never happen again. All right, so, so that's sort of the background. Now let me just address this, this, this new state statute. <clears throat> we took our appeal. We had conference calls with Mr. Scott, Mr. Hauser, the lawyers for the applicant, and we worked out a briefing schedule. And th this is, th th these dates are, this is, this is a briefing schedule established by Mr. Hauser, and March 24, 23 was the deadline for the motion to dismiss on jurisdictional grounds, which they, my adversary filed. April 14th was the deadline for my memorandum, which we filed. April 21 was the deadline for the applicant's reply memorandum, which they filed. So to use jargon for a lawyer who does, who does uh, courtroom work and administrative law work, the briefing on the motion to dismiss was done as of April 21, 2023. Now on May 3, the state en enacts a statute and my adversary is trying to argue that tonight he didn't move to dismiss the case on the basis of that. It's not even before, I'm not saying it's not an issue that you don't have to consider. At some point you will, and we have observations about that ordinance, but it's not part of the motion uh, to dismiss tonight. But in the event that you think it is, let me just address some of the key points. A political subdivision, the state says, may, that's you, the county commissioners, may establish reasonable zoning requirements for cannabis business businesses. A political subdivision may establish reasonable zoning requirements for cannabis businesses. 
They may not establish zoning requirements that unduly burden a cannabis licensee. There is nothing about the rules in St. Mary's ordinance regarding non-conforming uses that treats a cannabis facility differently than any other use uh, in the county. There's nothing unique about the, the application of law uh, uh, to a cannabis facility. This is, this, this is traditional zoning analysis. Is this, did this use conform or not, did this expansion conform or not with the, the county rule regarding uh, expansion of uh, non-conforming uses? So for all those reasons, on behalf of my citizen appellants, all of whom uh, are absolutely committed to this case, all of whom care about their communities, uh, I ask you to deny the motion to dismiss and allow us to have a full hearing on the merits on June 8th on the question of whether we can, whether there was or was not an illegal expansion of the non-conforming use. At that time, we'll argue uh, that there was. My adversary will argue that there was not, and this body will make a decision. Uh, so for all those reasons, I urge the, this body to deny the motion to dismiss. Thank you so much for your time. Any questions of Mr. Nelson? No, sir. I got one. Yes, sir. What's the difference between intensity and expansion of use? I'm sorry. What is the difference between intensity and expansion of use? Well, there, there's different ways to answer that, and I'm not being evasive, but, but the, in the trip case, Judge Bell used the word intensity. He was interpreting the Baltimore County Correction, Baltimore City Ordinance. But this, this is what I think the difference is. We're not talking about an expansion, literally, of the footprint of the structure. That's still the same. We're talking about the question of whether there's an expansion or enlargement of the existing use as distinguished from the footprint. And, 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 and what this body is gonna be obligated to do is look at the words of the ordinance and ask yourself, what do they mean? Right. Uh, and different people see words differently, but this is not what I think they mean. Expansion or enlargement of a use includes modifications that allow you to triple the number of employees from 25 to 75, that allow you to, to multiply by 30 times in the quantity of plants you can process, that allow you to almost double your sewage output, output uh, and uh, require an almost doubling in the size of the reserve, reserve, sewage reserve area, which is documented on the two uh, site plans. I believe that when you look at the words of this, of your ordinance, those words include those types of changes. And therefore, this use is an illegal expansion of a non-conforming use. I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. We heard from Mr. Cherry that the site plan has been essentially the same, and it was approved originally in October of 90, uh, 2021. I, I think that's correct. He also indicated that there's been no change to the site plan through this amendment process. It also appears on the site plan, if you look at the plan itself, there are over 120 parking spaces. Now, do you think that was specifically designed for 20 employees? I didn't prepare that narrow point, but let me just uh, see if I understand. I, I think what you're suggesting to me is that on the original plan, there were 120 parking spaces. And how do I square that with the, their evidence that there's 20 employees there? I haven't looked at that. But, 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 but. In addition, the in expansion of the employees is from 20 to 76, and we still have 
120 parking spaces. Yeah, I, I haven't studied, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. I, I, I think what I'm trying to get at is that it was always an intent to expand this building in the future and expand the uses and expand the product that comes out of the buildings. Huh? And, and therefore, there was really no non-conforming use hmm. that's been passed. Right, Mayor Same thing holds true for the septic system. There are notes on the plans that indicate the capacity for one of the septic systems is 1,170 or so gallons per day. That'll handle a lot of people. Hmm. Well, with all due respect, sir, I disagree. And let me tell you, try to explain why. I'm sure when they embarked on this project, they had every intention to expand because it's a absolute gold mine, right? Tremendous economic pressure all over the state to build these facilities. I'm sure they had every intention to make this as big as they could. But that's not the question before the board. The question is, what was the effect of this zoning text amendment that was enacted by the county commissioners in 2022, which overnight converted this by right use to a non-conforming use? That's a, that's, that's a legislative fact that's indisputable that as of that moment, this use became an, a non-conforming use then the question of what their intent was prior to that is totally irrelevant. What's relevant is what was on the ground and have there been changes, have there been changes to that since that date and whether those changes constitute or not a legal or an illegal expansion of a nonconforming use. So with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, what their intentions were their intentions were to make as much money as we can, and the bigger the operation we have, the more money we're gonna make. But that's, that's the American way, but that doesn't mean that's the land use analysis. The land use analysis, what was the effect on the date this zoning to dex amendment was enacted, and what changes, if any, have, have occurred since then? That's my response to your observation. Can I ask the county attorney a problem, a question? <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Knowing that there were bases for substantially more employees, then the county passed an ordinance changing the requirements for cannabis. How does that fit with vested rights? A uh, pardon. Ask, I didn't quite catch the, um, you're a little bit distant from the microphone there and didn't catch the end of the question. Sorry about that. My apologies. If, thank you for reminding me. If, if we had a number of parking spaces and a, and a site plan that was approved that handles, let's say, 120 people because that's how many parking spaces there are, then the county passes an ordinance changing the cannabis regulations. Does that facility now have vested rights for the 120? I don't know if there's a statutory or case law authority to make that exact point. Um, not that I can give you all that precise of an answer on this one, but what I think I will say is that the perspective Lugum took when we looked at it is that the grow house was approved. That site plan depicted a 52,000 odd square foot building with so many HVAC generators, with so many parking spaces, et cetera. We knew it was coming. The thought we took is that whatever they want to use the inside of that building for, whatever they can jam into it, however many people they can get into it, that the consistent way to approach Maryland's laws were to say that as long as the four walls on it, as long as the square footage does not change or grow larger, we cannot call it an expanded use and that what they have is a vested right to build the structure as it was depicted on that site plan. Thank you. I, um, again, I, I don't think the parking spots, how many are on there one way or the other is necessarily dispositive or should be taken one way or the other. Thank you. Any other questions from the board members, Mr. Nelson? So one question on the wording of your appeal. Do you have that? I've been looking for to read the appeal. Put that there. How was your appeal worded? 
because that seems to be the contention or a contention is what you guys are actually appealing. The wording of your appeal, when you filed your appeal, what were you actually appealing according to what you guys wrote? Mr. Nelson, Mr. Bradley's looking at your November 9, 2022 letter. I, I, I was having a hard time here with the, the microphone. He's asking about the, the wording of the appeal and he's looking at the November 9, 2022 letter. Right. Okay, so Mr. Bradley, the, the um, direct, th this is the key sentence in that letter. If you go down to the very bottom of the first page, where it's mic. the very bottom of the first, I beg your pardon, of the first page in the middle of the line, it says further, appellants assert that the Department of Land Use and Growth Management erred when it determined that the modifications to the septic system did not constitute an enlargement or expansion of the non-conforming use. So what we're alleging there is that this amended site plan that was approved on uh, November 11th, correction, uh, October 11th, uh, constitute an illegal uh, expansion of a non-conforming use. Thank you. Any other questions from the board members? No, sir. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, sir, very much. Mr. Nelson. the uh, opportunity to address the board. Mr. Terry. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, with, with all respect, Mr. Nelson would lead this board to error, and I'm gonna um, discuss a number of issues that were raised during his argument. First, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address your question about the parking spots. I think a corollary to your question is what was imagined when a 52,000 square foot building was allowed in the site plan and not appealed, when there was already a septic for 25 people, no one would have imagined that the same septic which was servicing the building that's already there is the only septic that would service the new larger building that was approved. It must have been that the things that are routinely expected to occur when there's been an approval from Lugham will also occur, and in this case, that's all that the septic is. It is a routine matter. There must be some method for the removal of, 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 this, of this, you know, waste, and that's what the septic is. It is just the natural extension of the approved and unappealed, and unappealed approval of the 52,000 square foot building. Now, members of the board, every single item that Mr. Nelson read to you from the site plan that described the septic and that he says are expansions, are merely different ways to describe the septic's capacity which the sugar loaf opinion has said is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the state and not within this board's jurisdiction. Now, Mr. Nelson said that he didn't file late. I didn't exactly say he filed late. I said he did not timely file from an appealable event because there was none. Mr. Hauser said to this board that, the, that Lugham exercised no discretion on October 11th. An appeal must come from the exercise of discretion. This board does not consider appeals from non-decisions. It only considers appeals from decisions. Noting a septic, which by the way, the, as I said in my presentation, and as acknowledged by Lugum in the letters that are attached to the motion, hadn't even been made yet. There was not an approval of the septic on October 11th. That didn't come um, until January. Nothing happened to create jurisdiction in this body. Um, members of the board, uh, um, when Mr. Nelson read to you provisions from the language of the notice of appeal that dealt with the site plan and said that I ignored it, I would just say that I didn't ignore it. I discussed the non-conforming use issues and answered questions about them. Um, but 
he says to the board that this isn't about a septic permit. Well, then why is the first sentence, the only substantive portion of the form, because there was also a letter attached, but on the form, Mr. Nelson wrote the following. Please describe requested action. Answer, appeal of the decision of the St. Mary's County Department of Land Use and Growth Management to issue a permit for a revised mound septic system. It's the first thing in the appeal. And everything else about the site plan makes this matter precisely like Sugarloaf, which was a site plan case. Um, Mr. Nelson read a provision from the St. Mary's Code about enlargement that is in every zoning provision in every county in the state about existing user structure. It doesn't change what Sugarloaf said or the limitations to the jurisdiction of this board. Um, and excuse me as I flip through some papers, I'm responding. Um, Mr. Nelson took great pains to describe the fact that his clients are legitimately chagrined by the existence of my client's facility. I would simply say that no one appealed from the approval of the building that is the subject of this appeal. The time is gone. If, they, if there was an effort, if there was a desire to say there shouldn't be an appeal, then that is not before the board right now. Mr. Nelson questioned the fact that counsel for the landowner brought to the board's attention the fact that the law on zoning with regards to cannabis facilities changed on May 3rd after acknowledging that the schedule ended before May 3rd. I would ask the board, if the law had changed on May 3rd to say that the septic system that was, a, that was um, approved to be installed at this property ha was illegal for some reason, wouldn't the board expect counsel to bring that to their attention? Counsel for the landowner didn't submit a new brief. Counsel wrote a letter describing the change in the law and saying that it would be an issue at trial and or merits hearing. I understand that the terminology is different here, but at the merits hearing. And so the purpose of the letter was to ask for a continuance because the law had changed and because the parties were thinking about, or in particular, the landowner was thinking about what evidence needed to be marshaled now at the hearing, which was different than the evidence that might need to have needed to be marshaled at a hearing where perhaps the governor had vetoed the bill and it wasn't the law. And so naturally we brought that to the board's attention as one would expect counsel to bring a material change in the law that's gonna affect a hearing. We didn't say change the date of the motion to dismiss. And I didn't ask the board to dismiss based on this change in law, although you know perhaps I could have. I said that the issue was one that would have to be addressed if the board declined to dismiss the case based on Sugarloaf and other law discussed at the hearing. And it is. If we go forward with the hearing, it's an issue we'll have to grapple with, whether or not the zoning ordinance that affects cannabis facilities exclusively is allowed under current law, which is different than it was at the beginning of this process. Um, Mr. Nelson, said, well, they're just another non-conforming use. That's actually the point of the new law. Is it a non-conforming use? What the law says is that um, cannabis facilities cannot be disproportionately regulated, that um, it deals with whether or not it's different than other similar industries. If that is relevant to the cannabis law, it's, it means that perhaps either as enforced or in total, the zoning ordinance can't be applied to my clients. It is not about non-conforming uses because the question is whether or not under current law, it is still a non-conforming use. Give me one, bear with me one moment. Just making sure I didn't miss any of the points I wanted to make. Um, members of the board, some of the discussion from Mr. Nelson made me think about it, another case. Um, Board of Appeals of Montgomery County versus Marina Apartments, which I'll say for Mr. Scott if he wants to, to look at it, is 272 MD 691. And it, his presentation made me think about it because it's just another case dealing with septics. And here's the posture. The case dealt with a um, property owner that wanted to install a large condominium building which, which some property owners did not want to see built. 
And there was an issue with the septic, not the septic, with the sewage, I wanna be precise here, with the sewage of that building, the sewage disposal, which I suppose it was a 1974 case, maybe if it was written today, they'd be talking about septic. But they were talking about sewage. And there was similar language in Montgomery County about septic as there is in St. Mary's County now, but there was also a state um, agency called the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, which is a state agency because it governs matters in multiple counties, and so state law um, defines that to be a state agency. Now, there was a merits hearing in front of the Montgomery County Board of, Appeal, Board of Appeals about whether or not the, the sewage for that building was appropriate. There had already been an approval, or there was pending, and ultimately was approved, the same matter in front of um, the state entity, the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, which had authority as the state agency dealing with um, property that was within a certain proximity of Washington, D.C. In fact, I think that that body deals with the district, you know, it's not just Maryland. And what the Court of Appeals said is, it doesn't matter that the Board of Appeals of Montgomery County ultimately determined that the sewage um, system was improper, that it was not sufficient, because it was a decision for the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. So that's the other side of the um, Sugarloaf case. In Sugarloaf, the Board of Appeals recognized that it had no jurisdiction over that matter and dismissed it and was affirmed. But in the Montgomery County case, the Board of Appeals held a merits proceeding where they heard all kinds of evidence about this sewage system, which a lot, involved a lot of work. And then it went up to the, this is a, an opinion of the State Court of Appeals, which is now the State Supreme Court, and they said, you didn't have jurisdiction to consider that. And so from our perspective, this board is now sitting at a crossroads. It can choose to either follow Sugarloaf, by that I mean the Board of Appeals in Sugarloaf, and recognize the limit of its jurisdiction, which if this ever went to a judicial review would be affirmed because they'd look at Sugarloaf, they'd say this is a septic system and that was an appropriate decision based on your jurisdiction. Or it could follow the example of the Board of Appeals of Montgomery County in Mo Board of Appeals of Montgomery County versus Marina Apartments, where they went the other way, which in, would in this case would involve multiple nights of hearing witnesses just to go to judicial review and we think certainly, and people might just disagree, but we think certainly would be reversed. And then the board would have to, on remand, enter an order dismissing the appeal. And we would submit that the board should follow the example of Sugarloaf and acknowledge the limits to its jurisdiction. The protestants here will have an opportunity to protest the septic system in front of the Office of Administrative Hearing um, before against the state and that is their opportunity. But they do not have, just because something was put on a site plan, by the way, putting the septic on the site plan is optional. All the information that Mr. Um, Nelson read is optional. What's required on the site plan is to note the location of the septic, but not the details, like how many gallons of water it's going to use. That's just not required. Because it's not within the jurisdiction of the Board of, no, of Lugum, and then of the Board of Appeals. Um, and so uh, I, I don't have anything else at the moment, but obviously I'm happy to answer any questions from members of the board or, or Mr. Scott. Uh, while you're still sitting there, I'd like to ask Mr. S Mr. Scott a question. He has repeatedly told us it's not in our jurisdiction, that it's not our job, it's not in our chain of command, but if, a group, uh, neighbors, whatever, group, ask us to get involved. Aren't we allowed to get involved? Or, or can we say, well, that's not our job? Uh, aren't we allowed to get involved if we're asked to? Um, <clears throat> so, Mr. Richardson, we're, we as a Board of Appeals are only allowed to get involved, quote unquote, if we have jurisdiction. And um, our jurisdiction. Um, primarily comes from the uh, CZO, and of course there's some state law regarding jurisdiction of, of boards of appeals. Um, and I think the case, this, this case before us tonight, we have to remember this is on the motion to dismiss. Um, 
and um, it could be, it, it, it certainly can be, and it is a little confusing because we've kind of got a, um, a crossing of arguments that uh, deal with the motion to dismiss and also may sort of deal with the merits hearing if we have a merits hearing. Um, but I think uh, if I could uh, narrow down the positions of the parties, and if I misspeak, then uh, certainly not intended, but I think um, the, uh, the proponent, the filer of the motion to dismiss, believes this case or this appeal that is in front of us tonight was a, an appeal of a septic decision. And then uh, on the other hand, as you heard Mr. Nelson say for these citizens, he believes this is a zoning case. This is an appeal of a zoning case that it had to do with a site plan. Um, and then, you know, that th therefore is within the jurisdiction of the Board of Appeals. And that's the real question. Um, in this case, our, our jurisdiction as a Board of Appeals really derives from the jurisdiction of Lugham below. And the question is, did Lugham have any authority uh, or did it have a decision-making duty or ability over the site plan um, wherein the site plan was simply renotated to note a change in the approved septic system. And I hope that makes sense to you. Thank you. <clears throat> if I might take the liberty of just addressing one point that Mr. Scott just raised, I would just note that Sugarloaf, the opinion we're relying on, was a site plan case. It involved um, an effort by protestants like those here today to take the fact that the septic was described in the site plan as grounds to appeal to the Board of Appeals of Frederick County, which the Board of Appeals of Frederick County found it had no jurisdiction and the appellate court agreed. Any other questions? Yeah, I had one. Uh, somewhere in... Are you asking who are you asking the question to or is? Right here. Somewhere in all this reading, it was either you or your colleague, you, you made some uh, argument about zip codes and uh, explain that to everyone here. Certainly. Um, I believe, Mr. Um, Board Member Payne, that this is a reference to um, an issue that came up in the opposition to the motion to dismiss where the protestants argued that, the, in their view, the fact that all of the protestants are aggrieved, which is a term of art of law. Aggrieved means you're basically affected by the arguably arguable decision here, right? So somebody who lives in Minnesota is not affected, right? So somebody who lives right next door to the property, may, maybe they're affected. That's a question of law. Um, well, we responded to that because that's not a jurisdictional question and our motion was just jurisdictional and certainly we're not waiving the ability to say that some or all of the protestants aren't aggrieved, which is a necessary requirement in order to be a party to this matter. And in our reply um, to the opposition, which I'm flipping through right now, please forgive me, um, we addressed that just to not leave that issue out there. Um, and there are members of the group of protestants who live more than a thousand feet away from the property, which is a matter of law in a case that Mr. Nelson argued at the Court of Appeals and lost, means that there is no, there is, they are not aggrieved. So for example, one of the protestants lives over 43,000 feet away and is in another dis a zip code. In fact, two of the protestants who are married. Um, oh wait. And then there's another, there, there are two more who are over 46,000 feet away. There are two that are over 5,000 feet away. There are two that are over 8,000 feet away. There's one that's about 1,300 feet away. And then what I didn't do in my reply, but reserve the right to do if there's a merits hearing, is note that of those that are left, several of them, it kind of depends on how you look at their property. If you're just measuring the distance between the corners of the property, some of them might be within 1,000 feet. But if you look at their home and compare that to the property, it's more than 1,000 feet as an example of some of the spatial issues that could be raised if this matter proceeds to a merits hearing. May I respond to that question? Sure. For better or worse, I'm familiar with Maryland's standing jurisprudence. Could you speak into the mic? Right. 
I say, for better or worse, I'm familiar with Maryland's standing jurisprudence, having argued for the cases that govern this principle in our Court of Appeals. Here's the rule. You need one protestant who satisfies the test for standing. That's the Bonarski case. One protestant who is aggrieved. And once you show that one protestant meets that test for standing, the agency of the court doesn't look at the standing of the others. The other point is the test for standing in an agency is different than it is in circuit court. So when he cites the Ben Ray case about the thousand feet, and we can talk about that rule for hours, that's a rule that governs standing in the circuit court. The rules for standing before an administrative agency are much more relaxed. But the point I'm trying to make is I have clients here who live almost uh, touching this property, well within a thousand feet. They will meet any test for standing if there's a circuit court review. But the fact of the matter is all of my clients, whether they're a thousand feet, 2,000 feet, 5,000 feet, um, uh, five miles, they, they're permitted to come in to an administrative agency and participate in the process because the test for standing is more relaxed in the agency. So that's my response. And Mr. Payne, may, may I just quickly offer a response to that? Yes. First, this isn't an issue in front of the board today. This is a matter just about jurisdiction. Second, I'll just say that, that um, the landowner disagrees with that summary of the law that Mr. Nelson just stated. Um, we will assert that standing in front of this board is limited to the thousand feet per protestant and that any protestants that are more than a thousand feet away do not have standing. We would also assert that there is law that is um, that deals with whether these folks are aggrieved, which would be at issue at a merits hearing, including whether they're really affected by the septic. Um, and we would assert that even the closest person to the property is not actually affected by the septic and has no standing. I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me if I could interject, I wanna caution the board. Um, and Mr. Payne, I appreciate the question, but I'm not so sure all of that is relevant for what we're looking at tonight. So I just wanna make sure we're not running down a, a rabbit hole that might be confusing us. I agree with that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board members? No, <coughs> no sir. The one question I got is one that I have asked a lot of people sitting in your chair. <clears throat> Thank the you board. for the, thank you for that part. <laughs> <laughs> the board knows what's coming. This case is about people, period. We can get into the technical arguments all day long. You got a room full of people. Has your client and the neighbors talked and discussed this issue? One of the things, and you alluded to it, and the other counsel alluded to it, was people were not aware that this was being built until they saw a huge building. <clears throat> people were upset that they didn't get notified. People have some pretty hard feelings about what's going on in their backyard. So I won't go to the obvious joke, but have you guys just talked to the neighbors and said, hey, how can we help make this better? How can we extend a hand and alleviate some of the concerns because there's a lot of concerns that have nothing to do with sewage or septic or whatever you want to call it. Well, board member Bradley, thank you very much for that question. Um, I can't speak to what communications there were prior to this matter. Um, I can't say that Mr. Nelson and I have had extensive conversations along those lines because we have not. Um, you know, it's a difficult task to be put on a, to be on a board like this one or to be a judge seeing a case where there's the intersection between people and the law. And sometimes um, one has to objectively look at the law and determine what the legal answer is irrespective of how upset it might make my client or the other side because the law is the law. And in this instance, um, whatever feelings the protestants have there were opportunities to appeal the building before today, 
and that is not the appeal that's in front of you. And we would simply say that as a matter of law, under the Sugarloaf opinion, there's no jurisdiction here. And um, if the board proceeds with a merits hearing and then that matter gets to judicial review, we would expect a reversal on this law. Um, but I appreciate your point and your question because <coughs> you're asking something that's less about the law and more about something else. And of course I, I am. Express, and I, I want to express empathy to every, everybody has feelings and everybody has emotions. But I, I'm just asking the board to, 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 to answer the legal question and then you've laid forth a challenge, which is to see if there can be some efforts between the folks who are protesting um, and the property owners. And I acknowledge that, that that's something to think about going forward. So thank you for laying out what we're supposed to do here. The weight is heavy, I know it. I've done this a couple of times now. But I wonder if your client would benefit from extending a hand. It might be a really good idea. Maybe so. Oh, so maybe, maybe that should so. be more than such, just a suggestion moving forward. And I don't know what efforts there were before, <clears throat> sir. And and I just a want to think. not much. Well, maybe not. All right. But I thank you very much for your question. And I really, I, I, I hope that I do have empathy for everybody. But also, I represent a client and we're here over, over a legal issue. Thank you. Any other questions of the gentleman? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, now I'd like to hear if the board needs or feels that there's any additional materials, information, arguments, or evidence that you may think <coughs> is necessary for this. I'd like to have um, Lugum Council answer just one or two questions about proximity to other things such as schools or churches or any other place that might be prohibited. Um, if you could answer that, or Lugum staff. Is this class one? Okay, Mr. Hauser. So I think the predicate on this one is that um, I do not see, um, I think Mr. Bradley, if you're in a place where your decision would turn on anything I'm about to say, that's not the point of tonight. This would enter into the realm of testimony. Mm -hmm. And I'll let Mr. Scott advise you further there. To the best of my understanding, no school, no church in close proximity to this particular facility. That was a concern we were sensitive to with the zoning text amendment. And we do disallow this use or a similar cannabis use from coming within 500 feet of a residence, a school, a daycare facility, or a substance abuse facility. Okay. Thank you. Any other information the board needs? Any more questions? I suppose now we get to the hard part, to have a discussion and make a decision on what we've heard tonight. Anybody want to start the conversation? Mr. We've Richardson. We've heard a lot about what we can't do, and I would like to think what we can do. I don't think we're restricted on what we can do. Uh, I, think, I think it's important uh, to know what we can do. That was, almost goes back to the question I had from Mr. Scott. Uh, I don't think we're restricted. But we have to focus on the issue at hand, which is apparently the septic system on the site and its yeah. approval. Yeah. The second thing, I would like to give the neighbors a voice, have them involved in it. Okay. So we've talked about jurisdiction a lot and Lugum has advised us on what the jurisdiction is. Um, I did have some conversations with council just prior to this, asking questions such as, where does our jurisdiction lie? Does the health department, um, anything that they pass, does that constitute state law? Is that a state agency? Of course, those answers were to the affirmative. Um, do we have the right to, or do we have the authority to make a variance to any state law? He explained that to me. Those were the kinds of things that uh, he and I had discussed. Um, the fact that the appeal reads one way 
and it seems to be very narrow in scope is kind of the deciding factor on this. We have to follow the law. No our Mr. Personal. Chair, I want to, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Bradley, I just want to clarify. Mr. Bradley says he had discussions with counsel. That was me, his counsel. I just want to yeah, make sure there sorry. was no, uh, ex part, <laughs> no uh, okay. indication of ex parte discussions. You have to clear me up well, a lot, don't make you? Sure I, <laughs> make sure I make that point. Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you again for saving my butt. Yeah, so yet again, we have to follow what the law says. Um, but however, with that being said, I think there are several layers to this thing that we might, it might actually fall in our court. And the layers which both councils alluded to were the things around the septic system, the erosion, things that we have traditionally brought before this board in other cases. We've looked at the land use requirements for erosion, we've looked at them for coverage, we've looked at them for lot coverage, all kinds of things. So at the appearance, it looks black and white, but I honestly think there's some layers there that we could, where we could be brought in. And for everybody here, I'm not making light of this proceeding at all, but it's appropriate, it's about septic systems. I, I think a lot of things about this stink. I really do. Um, that being said, uh, I, I feel the horse is out of the barn. You feel? I'm sorry. What? The horse is out of the barn. I'm, I, you know, I don't think we can, uh, you know, deny the septic system. We, I don't think we have jurisdiction over it. Uh, and that's that's what this is to me. Um, I know we discuss septics and stuff all the time on the board, but not not in this respect, not not like this. Well, um, I I feel that uh, with the approvals that have occurred along the way, and early back is eighty one, I think, and then the passage of the county's law, the new change for cannabis and zoning regulations, I think the fellow has, a comp, uh, has uh, obtained a um, non-conforming use, but they also have a uh, uh, vested right in, in what that is there. So that they've established that. They've got facilities that were built for expansion. They may have only 20 employees now, 25 employees now, but it's obvious that that was gonna expand and that all occurred after the approvals. So I think that in that regard, the, the, the applicant, uh, let me get that one straight, that the Blue Grizz has a vested right in that, and I don't think it changes it. And I think that same thing applies to the septic system that the septic system's gotta be built to meet what's there, and that's the health department's regulation or requirements. That's their bailiwick. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Somebody wanna make a motion then? Well, I'll make a motion and then we can go from there, unless anybody has anything else. In the matter of ZAAP number 18 0000 1405 Seven Points Agri Cultivation Center, I move that the Board of Appeals grant the motion to dismiss the appeal of the planning director's October 11th, 2022 decision, allowing amendment of the site plan to reflect the revised septic system plan. Is there a second to the motion? A second. Any discussion on the motion? <clears throat> Therefore, I'll call for a vote. Mr. Bradley? Come back to me. I'm struggling with this one. I won't lie. Could we read the motion again, please? <clears throat> In the 
in the matter of ZAAP number 18-0000-1405, Seven Points Agricultivation Center, I move that the Board of Appeals grant the motion to dismiss the appeal of the Planning Director's October 11th, 2022 decision, allowing the amendment of the site plan to reflect the revised septic, septic site plan. Thank you. No. No. Yes. No. Yes. As you can see, an order ref uh, the board has made a decision. An order reflecting the board's decision, excuse me, the motion to dismiss is denied. A hearing. Hearing on the merits is scheduled for June 8th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in this room. The board's reasoning for the denial of the motion to dismiss will be included in the written order prepared following the merits hearing. Mr. Chairman, may I address the board for one related issue? I think it's a little late, but go ahead. <laughs> um, one is personal. Um, I recently found out after a previous motion to for a continuance that my middle school son's graduation is on the evening of the 8th. And so to have the merits trial begin on 6.30 in the 8th, I would ask the board to consider the next available date as the first day of any merits hearing so that I can attend my son's graduation. Um, and then when the board um, meets privately to consider the order, um, that the board might consider whether notwithstanding its decision to deny the motion, there's any narrowing of the issues that you, the board might consider appropriate. That is all. How does the board feel about changing the date of the meeting? Mr. I'm Chair, okay. could we hear from uh, Mr. Nelson on that uh, change of date? I think that would be appropriate. Thank you. And I can't uh, speak for the board's calendar, but 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 I work with lawyers every day of the week on adjusting schedules, so of course we'll accommodate that request. Sure, I can't hear you. I said, of course we'll accommodate that request. And, uh, and with respect to his observation about narrowing the issues, I would propose that, that uh, Mr. Hauser, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, and Counsel for the African I meet and speak about uh, uh, reaching stipulations as to the evidence. Uh, which I'm happy to do, but this, the short answer is yes, we'll accommodate his request, it's reasonable. Uh, we're hopeful that we can pick a date that's convenient for the board. Next available date? June 22nd is the next available date. Not the 13th. And then we'd be looking at August, <laughs> I believe. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. We could do the What was the date again? June 22nd. June, 20. June 22nd? June 22nd, correct. Perhaps with stipulations, one day will be enough, but we don't know sitting here right now if that's the case. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, 10 miles out to sea on June 22nd. Okay. <laughs> so the if the condition of my consent to the postponement is rescheduled to Jan June 22nd, that's the, I, I can't consent to that, but um, may I suggest we speak with staff by phone tomorrow and and mm -hmm. see if we can't work this out? No, we should do this tonight. Uh, that okay. Way, that way we it, can. Please take no disrespect. I'm going to grab my phone for my calendar in case that's relevant. Uh, we could look at the 20th of July, perhaps. We have the meeting room for the second and fourth Thursday of the month. Mm -hmm. um, your members of the board, just to echo what Mr. Nelson said about we're talking to staff tomorrow, there might be witnesses who aren't here today whose calendars are relevant. Um, and so while I appreciate the desire to figure it out tonight, um, maybe it's prudent to convene tomorrow with staff, see if a, um, calendars can be accommodated and go from there. I do wanna speak up on the just this one issue of whether or not we can schedule it later or with staff. Um, and 
course, county staff's perspective is we'll defer to council and go with whatever is most convenient for the other parties and what they decide on. But I do feel strongly that there at least has to be a date set certain tonight because we are an on the record proceeding. If it's going to be continued, the only way we get through that without having to rerun advertisement and giving notice to public the members in the back and those who want to go is picking a date certain tonight now if we pick a date certain tonight and then have to change it all right we can figure that out come back in on that date and then we've done it before we just we summarily should. continue it that day but we do need to at least set a date tonight to do something on okay did you understand that i appreciate that thank you okay now that we want to come up with a date the so we're saying that july uh, June twenty second is not an option. Is that correct? Right. Uh, that's okay. So then we're something. looking at July twentieth. Madam Clerk, I, I'm not available July twentieth. I'm really sorry. <laughs> August tenth. I need my parachute. <laughs> you better be. Here. August. Uh, August. 10th oh yeah. The, August tenth was the next date. Yeah, that's correct. Pardon me. I'm just having trouble with my device. <laughs> August tenth would work for council for. The property owner. August 10th. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't come prepared to, to pick a hearing date. I thought we were set for June 8th. Uh, I opened my remarks by saying I'm happy to accommodate council's request, but I can't on a moment's notice. I don't have my calendar here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, as, as Mr. Hauser indicated, we can set the meeting for that date as a date certain and a place certain, which is here. Or we could spend, if we find out between now and then we can't make it, we can again open and close the meeting that date and then suggest another date. Or we could set it for June 8th and do it the same June 8th. I can't, I mean, if we do that, then it won't solve my problem. And if that winds up being the decision of the board, I certainly understand. But I'd like the opportunity to go to my son's graduation if that's possible. And I, I would just wonder if we could set August, and this might be a question for Mr. Hauser, set August 10th, and then if tomorrow Mr. Nelson discovers that that's an available date, we can proceed, and if he discovers it's an unavailable date, that we could find other dates and that it could be confirmed at this board's next hearing on June 8th, whether we're here or not. Mr. Hauser. So I can see two ways of doing this, I think. Both relatively simple in the grand scheme of things. As I'm slicing up the conversation, it's we think August 10th might be the first day where we could practically do it, where we don't have a problem with Mr. Nelson's schedule or Mr. Cherry or Mr. Hershey's schedule or Mr. Scott's schedule. And whatever my schedule is in August at this point, <laughs> I'll quit. Or, or whatever whatever I might have on that calendar ain't going to be an issue. I promise that. Um, we can do that, and if lo and behold, it turns out August 10th doesn't fit, Lugum can put on hold the next available after that date after that, which would be August 24th, 24th. or September. Hold on. Uh, September 14th. Okay. Okay. And if I might just add that there are so many appeals about this that are going to be going on, they don't even have a date for the for the septic appeal for OAH. They're having a preliminary matter in July, which is going to set a trial that's probably not going to begin until the fall. I and so wanna, I don't want to hear any of that. I'm just raising the point that it's not that far off from a scheduling perspective. Okay. That's all. The the other question is 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 if I remember correctly, we were. Is, has there been a stay on the production and the operation of the facility? No, there was a certification from Lugum that it would be a loss of property and life if the uh, matter was stayed because then you'd have to kill all the plants. Um, okay. And so that issue was handled pursuant to the code. That's good. Ma Gentlemen, August 10th. No, may I be heard, please? Yeah, I just checked my personal schedule. I was able to, uh, I'm unavailable on, on August 10th. I'm available June 8th, I'm unavailable June 22nd, I'm unavailable uh, August 10th. I regret uh, that council has the conflict, but they have two lawyers uh, representing the applicant. Mr. Hershey can try the case in the first night. The, I will remind the board that there was a request for postponement, uh, which my client supposed, and this board, this board uh, denied. When I agreed to accommodate his schedule, I didn't know we were talking about a uh, uh, two-month delay. Okay. Um, is there a possibility of getting the meeting date at a 
different time rather than the Thursday, second or fourth Thursday? I would have to check with staff. Okay, so let us do this. Let us hold the meeting for June 8th, and in the meantime, we will check for an additional date. We can do that, yes, sir. Okay, let, let's do that, and then we can make a decision then as to what's gonna happen. So should we expect to hear from Mr. Hauser then about, yes. about that? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Everybody in agreement with that? Okay. I think what's that- the, What's the date now? <laughs> June 8th. Uh, let me just float this one. What about um, for council June 29th? Uh, again, more for the public edification so they can understand why this is so difficult. Lugum does not, it, this meeting, this room is in high demand. We've got about 40 boards, committees, or other commissions that meet. Much of them meet in this room, and it is difficult to just bump stuff without checking in. The um, central services in this building controls the availability of this room. We've got certain days set aside for the Board of Appeals, but outside those second and fourth Thursdays of every month, Stacy just isn't going to know in the normal course of her job. Right. As it just so happens, one of the other jobs that um, or boards I staff, I had to pick a date, and I'm seeing as of 12.35 today, June 29th was available for this room. Would that work? No. Oh. And I think we continue June 8th if the proponent or the applicants feel very strongly they under no circumstances will be in a state to proceed without Mr. Hershey being there. I, I presume they were, Mr. Cherry, pardon me. Then I, I presume they can file a motion to continue and the board can decide that night what they want to do. We keep it on the record. <laughs> Look for any possible available dates other than those three, four Thursdays now in June and early July that might work to get us something sooner than August. On behalf of my clients, I request that we set it for June 8th, that we speak by phone tomorrow to see if we can find a date. But for example, you know, I said I commented the lawyer. They said, what's wrong with June 29th? Well, you know, I have a family. I have a son living on the western shores of Ukraine who's flying home to visit me that week. You know, I have obligations too. We schedule those. It's not just council. We had a date on the calendar, June 8th. And I, let me just say, I didn't exactly say what was hey, just I, said. I think we've settled the problem. Yeah. I think we've settled the problem. Okay. Now. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to the next item. Thank you, board, for okay. your consideration. What's the date again now? June 8th. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The next item we have on the agenda is approval of the minutes, and they were, I believe, mailed out to everybody. Yeah. And I will take a motion to approve or amend. Make a motion to approve. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Anything for the good of the cause? No. A motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I'm back in. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, well, I, I will take this time to wish everybody a happy and safe Memorial Day. Uh, on that note, motion to adjourn. Second. Favor? Aye. Good meeting. Yeah, I will they, got, they got me.